Good morning. Good morning. I'd, like I'd like to thank Sages, Sages for inviting us to be a part of this session. Of this session. Today, Today, I'll be, I'll be discussing, discussing the fate of the cholecystostomy tube following, following percutaneous cholecystostomy. I have no disclosures for this presentation. Receiving a consult from the emergency department for a 34-year-old otherwise healthy female with acute onset of right upper quadrant pain following fatty food ingestion is a common clinical scenario that most of us feel comfortable managing. However, when receiving a consult from the intensive care unit for an 89-year-old male with acute respiratory insufficiency from pneumonia requiring intubation and vasopressor support with new onset of right upper quadrant pain, it is safe to say that some of us may feel uneasy managing this patient. Cholecystectomy is a standard of care for the management of acute cholecystitis in those patients who are fit for surgery. Nevertheless, a proportion of patients with acute biliary disease will be high risk or unfit for surgery due to their chronic underlying comorbidities or co-occurring acute disease states. For these patients, the use of a percutaneous cholecystostomy tube, or PC tube, has been suggested as an alternative management for the treatment of their acute biliary disease. The purpose of our study was to evaluate the long-term efficacy of PC2 placement for the management of acute biliary disease. In order to answer this question, all patients who underwent PC2 placement at our institution from the years 2000 through 2012 were identified in a prospectively collected institutional database. Only those patients who underwent PC2 placement for acute biliary pathology and those patients with long-term follow-up data available were included in our analysis. Those patients who underwent PC2 placement for decompression of their biliary tree in the setting of known malignancy, and those patients who were lost to follow up following PC2 placement were excluded from our analysis. At our institution, PC2 placement is performed by the Department of Interventional Radiology through a subcostal transperitoneal approach in order to minimize the risk of hepatic parenchymal injury. For the sake of statistical analysis, those patients who underwent PC2 placement were divided into three groups including those who underwent PC2 placement only, those patients who went on to have surgery following PC2 placement, and those patients who required reinsertion of a PC tube following elective removal of their original PC tube. Those patients who had PC2 placement only were followed until the time of elective removal of their PC tube or until the time of death. Those patients who went on to have surgery following PC2 placement were followed for 60 days postoperatively or until the time of death. And those patients who required reinsertion of a PC tube were followed for 60 days post reinsertion or until the time of death. Retrospective chart review was performed and information regarding patient demographics, PC tube placement, and post procedure outcomes was collected for all identified patients. Comparisons were then made between the three groups on a variety of clinical outcomes using the Kruskal Wallace and Pearson's tests. A total of 332 patients underwent PC2 placement at our institution from the years 2000 through 2012. 21 of these patients had PC2 placement for known malignancy, and 26 patients were lost to follow-up following PC2 placement. This left a total of 285 patients available for analysis. These patients were then divided into their respective intervention arm. 192 patients underwent PC2 placement only, 82 patients went on to have surgery following PC2 placement, and 11, 11 patients required reinsertion of a PC tube. We, we first compared the groups in terms of patient demographics. Patient, patient comorbidities are reflected in the Charleston Comorbidity Index. Those, those patients who went on to have a cholecystectomy following PC tube placement were significantly younger and healthier than either those patients who had PC tube placement only or those patients who required reinsertion of a PC tube. Next, we looked at the PC tube variables within the three groups. No differences existed between the three groups in terms of the indication for PC2 placement or the size of PC2 placed. We also looked at the number of tube exchanges required in those patients who had PC2 placement only and those patients who went on to have a cholecystectomy following PC2 placement. A majority of patients in both groups did not require any tube exchanges. For those patients that did require a tube exchange, the most common indications was for tube dislodgement, leakage around the tube, or tube occlusion. We also looked at the gallbladder fluid characteristics of all patients who underwent PC2 placement. Gallbladder fluid is aspirated at the time of original PC2 placement and sent for routine culture. Only 59 patients had positive cultures, and the most commonly isolated bacteria were Enterococcus and E. coli. 
Next, we looked at the surgical outcomes in those patients who went on to have a cholecystectomy following PC2 placement. The average time from PC2 placement to surgery was 112 days. Almost half of the patients who went on to have surgery had a planned open cholecystectomy, while nine patients required inversion from a laparoscopic to an open approach. Finally, we compared the morbidity and mortality outcomes between the three groups. Very few patients in any group experienced sepsis following PC2 placement or have had a cranial injury requiring intervention. 30-day readmission is reflective of the 30 days following original PC2 placement. Those patients who went on to have surgery had a significantly higher 30-day readmission rate. Indeed, some of these patients had ongoing abdominal pain and biliary symptoms for which they underwent surgical intervention earlier than the average 112 days found within this cohort. Nevertheless, the 30-day, 60-day, and total mortality within this group was significantly lower than either those patients who underwent PC2 placement only or those patients who required reinsertion of a PC2. In conclusion, patients who undergo PC2 placement can be divided into three groups. One, those with chronic underlying comorbidities. Two, those with co-occurring acute disease physiology. And three, those with delayed presentation of their acute cholecystitis symptoms. Patients who go on to have surgery often fall within the second and third category and are younger and healthier. Nevertheless, PC2 placement is a viable long-term option for comorbid patients unfit for surgery. Thank you.